All right, why don't we, uh, why don't you find the stress in uh, CD there, eh? Why don't you see if we can do that? Okay. Okay, so why don't you find that? This is that problem we were working on a bit yesterday. I think it's on page 140. Um, so why don't you see if we can find the stress in CD? internal ought to be about 1600. You okay with that? Okay. Pretty, you know, pretty straight up stuff here, but uh, just get that figured out because, you know, we, we do this a fair amount. Anybody having trouble getting that 1600?
So you can take either side, it really doesn't matter which one. But you've got those two 800 Newton, or excuse me, 800 Newton forces to the left at D. So you'd want to be um, combining those into 1600 Newtons. And then uh, that would be the internal force. It's compressive because the two 800s are pushing to the left. And that one, All right, so you get that internal force of 1600 compression. Any questions on that bit? And just divide out the area would be the next thing to do. All right. Okay, so so that's that's a fundamental thing that we do here in this class, and we, we want to be sure that you're uh, comfortable with that. Okay. All right. So, and so what we're doing there, we're getting... Uh, the compressing kind of pushing action, you know, it'd make more sense to use the right hand side where you just have that 1600 to the left right there. But you could also use all of this stuff and add it up to the left if you wanted. It'd be more work, but you could do it. Okay, I mean, either way, we'll get you the same answer. So you could use all of this stuff here and it still adds up to be the same. So PCD on the left hand side is actually to the left and PCD on the right hand side is to the right. So when you solve for them, they're actually doing that. See, because you get negative answers. Okay, I assumed them in tension, pulling on the bar, but I got a negative answer. That means they're actually compression. Okay, so we're not so tied into direction on these as whether they're pushing or pulling is really how I think about the signs. Okay. And then once you got that, you just divide it by the cross-sectional area. All right. So we good? Questions? All right. Okay. All right. All right, now, um, why don't we just take a quick look at the next one here. And the next one is strain. So let's have a look at that. So what we're doing here is called stress. Now, the variable that we use for stress is sigma, all right, and that's a, a Greek letter. And, you know, these, of course, we got our alphabet from the Romans who got theirs from the Greeks, who got theirs from the Phoenicians, who got those theirs from some other Canaanites, who got theirs from the Egyptians. That's kind of how that went, I guess. But, but anyway... But I guess we're more concerned about the Greek letters here. So what we have here is this Greek letter sigma. That's called sigma, and that means stress. Okay? That eventually, I think, turned into our lowercase cursive s, I think is how that went, but I'm not quite sure. Somehow that turned into an s, sigma for s. Okay. All right. So, uh, so there you go. So that's sigma. Now the next thing we'll look at here will be strain. Okay. All right, so strain's on 150, and what strain is, is delta, which is deformation. Now that's a lowercase delta, so that's D 
for delta. A lot of words we can use for that, and luckily they all begin with D. We can call it deformation, we can call it displacement, we can call it delta, um, deflection. There's a lot of different things we can call it, and it all starts with the letter D, so that's good. All right. So what we do for strain is we take how much a point on the object moves as the material stretches or compresses or does whatever it's doing, and then we divide that by the original length. So the units on, on strain are unitless. There's no units. It's length over length. They cancel out. What you're getting there is kind of a proportion of lengthening or, or shortening or something like that is what you're getting because you divide out the original length from it. Okay. So why don't we uh, look at 130? Do you all have that? If you don't, you can draw it up. I, I can't remember if I've got a little stapled handout or no. It may not be there. I can't remember. It isn't, isn't. If, if you got the book, it, it's in there. If you don't, just draw it up. It's just a circular. Oh, do you got it there? Oh, it's, is it out of order or something? A little bit? Okay, so yeah, you got it in that staple handout apparently, so we're good. 130. All right, so what we got here is we've got this bar, and it has a circular cross section with a six centimeter diameter, okay? And then we're going to pull on it. And when we do, we're going to stretch it. And that's something we're going to find out in this class, is anytime you apply a load to something, it changes shape. It deforms a little bit. So this thing's going to deform a little bit. Originally, it was exactly 1.2 meters long. And now it's 1.2003 meters long. Okay. So let's go ahead and find the strain in the thing. Okay. Now what strain is is epsilon, okay? And that's the Greek letter epsilon, and that looks like a backwards three, and you could probably tell that eventually turned into our letter E for epsilon, okay? And that's delta over L. So let's find out what uh, delta is. How much does this thing lengthen by after it's pulled on? And it's not going to be much. For structural type materials like uh, metal and concrete and stuff like that, you know, you don't get much deformation. Especially not when you use meters as your base unit. Yeah. So what do we got here? It's 0 0.03 mil centimeters, 0.3 millimeters, something like that. Okay, so I'm just taking the final length and subtracting off the initial, and that gets me how much longer it got. Okay. And then if you take that, and by convention you use the original length, divide it by the original length, you'll get the strain. So we got three Greek letters here so far, right? Delta for lengthening or shortening or moving in some fashion. Epsilon for the strain, which is the ratio of how far it moves to the original length. And then sigma for the stress. For some reason, for the load, we usually use the letter P. I don't know why, but we do. The load is a force, same thing. Now, we use the same sort of sign convention, so this thing is uh, getting longer, so we, um, we um, call that positive, okay? And that's a unitless number. So that's the strain. So we're doing all right with that. And you can think of that as a proportion of lengthening. If, if you took two zeros off of that, that would be 0.025% lengthening, you could say. But we just usually speak about it as a straight ratio. So that's 0.00025. Okay. 
which is the proportion of lengthening. Okay. So we all right with that? Which is delta over L. That's about it. Okay. All right. Now, as it turns out, these two things are related to one another, the stress and the strain. And there was a scientist called uh, Young, I think it was, Young, yeah, Young who, who investigated that a little bit and came up with a way of graphing this up. And, and there's a typical way that materials behave. And so we want to have a look at that. Okay. Good. So let's have a look at that. All right, now what we do here is we test this stuff out and we look at the relationship between stress and strain. Okay. So let's have a look at that. Now to do that, we take what are called test coupons and they look something like that. They're pieces of metal that are ground down to standard shapes. The smaller ones are rectangular. There's also larger circular ones that are used. So that one on the left is titanium, and the one in the middle is aluminum. One on the right is iron. Okay. And then what we do is we put them in a machine. It's a hydraulic machine with jaws on it. It looks something like that. So the sample goes uh, in, in between the two jaws. So the sample goes in there, okay? And then what you do is you turn this hydraulic machine on and it's got quite a lot of force that goes into it and the jaws move the opposite direction. And then they just pull that sample apart and you can see how, how it's broken, how they've broken, there, okay? And you pull them apart till they break. Usually at a, at a standard rate of pulling them apart, you use a standard, um, either rate either with distance, certain amount of distance per unit time, or force, one or the other. All right, and so what you do here is not only do you measure the load that it takes to break them, but you also put something on there called an extensometer, which is just a little thing that measures distance. <clears throat> so that thing goes on there, and it's just a, a device that measures the lengthening. So generally speaking, what happens is that thing uh, fits into the device or on the sample. Hmm. Well, it doesn't seem to want to work too well, and of course that ain't going to work, so I'm not quite sure. But anyway, it, it just fits on there um, and is attached to the sample. Maybe we'll get a better look at one of these here later. Well, okay, and then it just uh, records the distance as the material pulls apart. And what we do then is we can come up with a graph. And the graphs all look a little bit different depending on what the material is, but the gist of the graphs is they look like this. All right, and so what we're plotting up is the normal stress on the y-axis, sometimes called axial stress. And that has, that's sigma, so that's the sigma axis. And I'm on, uh, is this page 125 or something? Or 125? Okay, so this is 125. Okay. And then on the x, x axis, we plot up strain, which is epsilon. Okay. So, so that's what we got going on here. Okay. So we got epsilon. And then we've got sigma. That's the stuff that we've got. All right, and we get a characteristic curve here. Now, this is kind of an idealized, simplified curve, but this is the basic idea that you get when you, you uh, test these samples. So what you have initially is the, a very simple relationship where the harder you pull, 
the more the material lengthens, okay? And that's this section in here. And ideally, there's a linear relationship between the two things. You can think of the chemical bonds as being like linear springs. And the harder you pull on them, the more they stretch out. And that relationship holds for a certain amount of time. Now, eventually, that relationship will break down. And what's happening when that occurs is you've got uh, the chemical bonds are breaking down. The atomic bonds between the atoms of the metal start to tear apart. And so you lose that nice, linear, simple relationship. And that point where you start to lose that relationship is called the proportional limit. That's the upper limit of where you've got a linear relationship between stress and strain. Now what you can look at for that limit in there is the change in stress divided by the change in strain, which would be the slope of the line. And that's referred to as the modulus of elasticity, or Young's modulus. So delta sigma over delta epsilon, sigma being the stress, epsilon being the strain, um, is that Young's modulus, or modulus of elasticity. Now it turns out we always start at a point zero zero with zero stress and zero strain. So delta sigma over de delta epsilon is the same thing as sigma over epsilon. Okay, so if we just pick a point up here on the linear part of the graph and find sigma and epsilon and divide them out, we'll get the slope of that line. And that's the modulus of elasticity, okay? So basically for that first part of the graph, what's happening is the harder you pull, the more it elongates. And that's a linear relationship, essentially. Okay. Now, the next thing that happens is you start to flatten out a little bit, typically. It takes a little bit less stress to make the material elongate. And what you're going to hit next is called the elastic limit. Okay. Now, the elastic limit is the limit at which if you release the load, the material returns to its original length. So what you've done there, you've really started to stretch those atomic bonds out, but they're able to recover, and the material returns to its original length. Okay, if you go beyond the elastic limit, if you take the load off, the material will not return to its original length. Okay, because some of those bonds have been damaged, and they can't recover. Okay, so that's called the elastic limit. Okay, now the next point you hit is the yield point. And what's happening there is you've started to tear those uh, atomic bonds apart and, and they just can't recover at all and you're starting to really destroy the integrity of the material. Metals actually form themselves into crystals. They're not really perfect crystals like a diamond or something like that, but they are crystals and they have certain patterns to them. They might be cubic or they might you know, there's different uh, structures. If you, if you get beyond that yield point, what you've done is you've torn apart a lot of those atomic bonds and the material just has very little strength anymore. So any additional stress will get you a lot of strain. So the material kind of flattens out and really elongates. And this is not the same phenomena, but the thing I think about with this is if you've ever blown up a balloon, you know how it's kind of hard to blow into the balloon and all of a sudden it just expands quickly? That's what I think about with yielding. It's like you pull and pull and pull, and then all of a sudden there it goes, like that, okay? So that, that's kind of yielding, okay? So what's happening are all those atoms are starting to move around in the crystal, and those bonds have, have broken. They're not doing too well. Now there's fracture lines in the crystal, and they start moving around, and eventually they're going to start knocking into each other and hitting each other and kind of binding up. And that will get you a second uh, period here of what's called strain hardening. So the graph will rise a second time until it hits what we call the ultimate stress, which is the maximum stress the material can handle. It'll then actually fall off a bit and then fail. That's the typical curve there. All right. Now the reason it falls off a little bit is actually more about calculating things than it is about anything else. Because when it starts to yield and really start and the material really starts to move around and then you, you start getting near failure, what the material does is called necking. It actually gets very thin about where it's going to fail. And what that does is changes the diameter 
of the sample, which changes the area, and that changes the stress calculation. Okay, so if you were actually calculating the changing cross-sectional area of the sample and using that to calculate the stress, this line would go up in the dashed configuration and keep rising. But the problem is that's just too hard to do, too hard to calculate, and too hard to track. So the convention here is to use what's called the nominal stress, where you can constantly use the original cross-sectional area. Okay? Because it's just easier mathematically to calculate that. To, to calculate the constantly changing diameter as that material necks and gets thin before it fails, it's just too hard to do. So they use the original cross-sectional area throughout the calculation. And using that number, it will appear that the stress falls off at the end. Okay. So that's basically what happens to a material as, as these processes happen. Okay. You got any, uh, and, and what I've got here, you know, on your actual handout, you've got some of the definitions down below. And on the next page, you've got a little bit of explanation of that uh, elastic limit, too. Okay. And why don't we uh, have a look at this for just a minute? If I can find it, that is. That's not it. I think that's it. So what if you stay under the elastic limit when you load and unload the material, the the uh, sample will return to its original length. So you'll load up the diagram and then just come right back. Okay. But if you go beyond the elastic limit, you get what they call a permanent set in the material. Okay, so if you go beyond that elastic limit where the graph starts to flatten out a bit and go beyond that point, when you unload, the material will return to a length that's a little longer than its original length. Okay. So these are just some different ways you can, uh, you can change material properties. Okay, so there's different tricks that are used to kind of get different properties out of metals. Okay. All right, now another thing that we're interested in is defining this yield point. Now that's the point where the material really starts to elongate quite a lot without any additional load being applied. All right, and there's a standard way to calculate this because uh, materials typically don't have a really well-defined yield point. When you're dealing with actual data, it's not quite as uh, defined. Now, this one's very well-defined. I mean, you can see where that occurs. But other types of materials may not have a really clean yield point. So if, uh, there's a standard official way to calculate this that I'd like you to know. Um, and so this is just... Uh, kind of the official way to do it. This allows everyone to do it the same way so that the answers are standardized, okay? So what you do uh, in this 0.2% offset method, it's called, is you find a strain of 0 0.002 on your x-axis here. And then you draw a line up parallel to the rising limb of the graph, and wherever that intersects your curve, is by definition the yield point. So that's the 0.2% yield point, it's sometimes called. Okay? And the reason is a couple. One is um, there isn't always a well-defined yield point, and also this way everyone's doing it the same way. So every, you know, everyone will define a material in the same way. That's the idea. So no big deal there. You just find a strain of 0 0.002, draw a line parallel to the rising limb of the graph, and see where you intersect. Okay. All right, so are we, we good with all that? This is a very standard, uh, commonly done material test you know, to define a material. When you look up in a table for materials, you'll see a few numbers off of this test. 
you'll see E, that's a very common number that we use. See, when we design stuff, we don't want to load them beyond a material beyond its proportional limit. Because when we do that, we're getting a little bit too close to failure for one thing. The other thing is we're getting close to yield. And when a material starts to yield, it gets really hard to predict what it's going to do. So we don't like going here, okay, when we do our design work. We want to stay typically down here. That's normally the range at which you're going to design your materials in when you're working with things. And as a result, E will have a meaning here because E is the slope of that line, this modulus. Um, once you go beyond that point, E doesn't really mean anything anymore because if you go beyond that proportional limit, what you're doing essentially is just saying the material's curve just keeps going straight up at that particular slope, and it doesn't, okay? So you don't use E beyond that proportional limit. So we're careful in, under normal circumstances not to load materials beyond the proportional limit. And when we do that, we can use E in our calculations, which we very commonly, which we very commonly do. So why don't we um, have a look at 130 there, and why don't you find the stress on that material? You should be able to do that uh, pretty readily there because we've got the load that's being applied, and you can find the area of the material. So given that, you should be able to figure out the stress pretty quickly. stress and then to find E just divide it into the strain. And when you do that, what you're getting is the slope of that linear part of the graph. See what, what that E value does is it allows you to, if you know stress, you can find strain. And if you know strain, you can find stress. It links the two together. And, and that's a real common uh, idea in this class is the relationship between stress and strain. We use that a lot to uh, in our work when we're doing structural stuff with these materials.
Are you doing all right with that? Let's take the force over the area and get the stress. And these numbers uh, typically get very big or very small, so you use scientific notation if we're out with them, you know. We'll take the 80,000 over the area, 0 0.002827. You'll get 28.3 times 10 to the 6. That's the stress. Then divide that into the strain. And you get 113 times 10 to the 9. Going around with that? Okay. That clock in the back, that thing's all over the place. It's about you know, a bit slow. Yeah, what's up? Uh, do you typically want uh, it representing gigapascal? Well, yeah, the question is, do you use gigapascals? I usually just go to the nearest power of three on the, you know, on those. Yeah, oh, no, that's an engineering thing, I think. That's normally what I do. So I, I might use megapascals, too. Typically, mega and gigapascals are the ones that come up for this structural stuff. All right. Doing all right with that? All right, now, again, I, I want to emphasize with you, there's that page 120 when you buy the notes, and that has kind of a key to all this stuff. And this is fairly typical in that there's lots of, there, this stuff is all pretty straight up. There, initially, what we go through, it's, it's, there's nothing really complicated, but there's just so much of it, and it all kind of interconnects. And you just got to keep track of what's what and what letter stands for what, because if you, if you fail to do that, it, it'll just turn into a bunch of gibberish, really. And so you want to kind of, in your mind, know what these relationships are and what stuff means. So, you know, you want to uh, kind of just every every night or whatever, just kind of review this stuff and get it in your head, what these different things mean. What sigma is, what epsilon is, what delta is, and all that, okay? Um, now, why don't we look? I'm going to get you just one homework problem, but it's going to involve some... Uh, Excel or Scilab or MATLAB or whatever. So let's just have a look at it because there's a couple little things about this that you probably want to know. So let's have a look. I think it's 111, I think. I honestly don't remember, but I think it's 111. And this will be due Friday, um, but, you know, we'll go over it uh, tomorrow if you got questions. So here it is. Um, Pretty sure it's 111. So we've got a sample here with uh, diameter 1.283 centimeters, and then uh, the original gauge length is 5.08 centimeters, and then we get this data here, and we're going to load it up until it fractures, okay? So that's what we got. And is this 111? Thanks. 111. So it's 111. Um, now, a couple of things on this. Um, what you're going to do is just output a graph. You, now, um, Excel works fine for this, um, but if you're a mechanical type, you might want to start getting used to MATLAB or Scilab. I know that stuff's a little bit harder to use, at least for me it is, but you know, it is what you're going to be using next year, so you might want to start getting used to it. The plot ought to look something like that. That's what Excel looked like about 30 years ago, I guess. Um, okay, so it's a stress versus strain. Now, stress on the y-axis, strain on the x. We want to remember that. And I'm asking you to find four things. E, which is the modulus of elasticity, the proportional limit, the yield, and the ultimate stress. So... You know, don't just give me a graph. I, I'm asking you four questions, so answer the questions. 
And you know, like if you're working in, when you start working in industry, you don't just hand the client a graph. You, you're being paid to tell them what the graph means. So, so pull those numbers off the graph, write them down, and put them in a box. Okay. So those four things, and the, you know, they're all spelled out right on 111. Okay. Now a couple. Now let's see. Let's kind of go through some advice on this thing if I can find it. Where am I? Okay, I'm here. Oh, no, I Stress strain. There we go. Okay, use a spreadsheet or Scilab MATLAB. Con be sure that you remember to convert the force into stress and the deformation into strain before you make your graph. Don't just plot up stress and strain. Calculate, uh, or excuse me, don't just calculate load and deformation. Calculate stress and strain. Okay, now if you use Excel, which, you know, certainly if you're a civil type, you probably want to do, um, use a scatter plot to plot the data. Okay, so don't use an XY graph because that doesn't plot the data properly. Use a scatter plot. List the answers to the questions in a box. You can draw in the offset line to find the yield stress by hand. Okay, so that's just some advice or just information on that. Okay, so what we've got here is we've got <laughs> that's due. We got what 102, 103, I think, and then this one 111. They're due Friday. We'll cover them tomorrow if you have questions. Okay.